Hello everyone. Welcome to the Action RPG lessons for Pixelpad. My name's Jake and I'll be guiding you through creating this game in Python. Pixelpad is a website that lets you create games using Python. When you first log in, you'll be brought to this page, the tutorials page. For the sake of this tutorial, you'll be going straight to the My Apps section though. Any apps you create will be in this section. Now you may or may not already have some apps created, but let's start fresh. Click on the Create App function. It's going to ask you for some info about your new app. You can skip the thumbnail and you can skip the description. We will want to name this app though. I'm going to just call it Action RPG. You can name it whatever you like. And make sure you're using the Pixelpad 2D app engine. Once you hit create, you'll be brought to the coding screen. Now let me explain all the different sections here. On the left, we have our assets. This is going to be all the classes, which are the objects in our game, rooms, which are like levels, sprites, which are all the visual aspects of your game, pictures and animations, sounds, which covers the sound effects and music, and functions, which we won't be looking at in this tutorial. In the middle is the code section. It's split up into two sections itself. It has a start and a loop, which I'll get back to in a second. On the right side, we have the canvas, which is where we're going to be displaying our game. If I hit the play button, you'll see that we get a nice big black screen. That's because our game is completely empty right now. Down below is the console. This is where we might get a message if we've done something wrong, whether it's an error or a bug, or if we just wanted to print a message ourselves. Now, let me quickly explain the difference between start and loop. If I write the word start in here, notice that it doesn't show up in the loop. They're two completely different sections of code. If I hit play, I get an error in the console because start is not actually a piece of code, it's just a word. Now if I delete this and instead say loop inside the loop and I hit stop and then play, I get a ton of messages in the console. And there we see the difference between start and loop. Start runs once at the beginning of the game, whereas loop keeps on going and going. Now we don't actually need this word loop in there, so I'm going to delete it and head back to the start. So, like I said before, classes covers all the objects we'll be having in our game. That could be the player, or the background, or an enemy, or a coin, or anything else. If it exists in our game, it's going to be as a class. Let's go ahead and create our first class, the player. Click on the plus sign beside classes and it'll ask you to name it. I'm going to name it player. Now each class can have its own set of code. Let me show you. Here I have the game code, but if I click on the player, I have different code. This lets us code every class differently, which is very handy because we want the player to act differently than an enemy. So once again, I'm going to delete this because it's still not any code. And let's go ahead and add this player to our game. We can do that with one line of code. But first, we need to give our new player object a name. Now this name can be almost anything you like. I'm going to name mine Hero. And I'm going to make him into a player class. And just like that, if I hit play, you'll see that my black screen has a little blue box in the middle. Now, you can name this player class anything you like. You can call him Bob, and he'll still show up. But I'm going to keep using the name Hero. Now, if you look really closely, inside that blue box, we have the words Empty Image. That's because we don't actually have an image for our object yet. 
we can add one by looking at the Sprites section. Now if you click the plus sign beside Sprites, it opens up the Asset Store. Pixelbat has a bunch of sprites you can use for free. The sprite we're looking for is named Hero Down. You'll have to push the next button a few times to find it. There he is. When you click Select Asset, it's going to ask you to name it. You can give it any name you like. Either Hero or Player seems appropriate to me. So I'm going to name it Player. In order to add the sprite to our object, we need to write another line of code. So at the end of the first line, press Enter, and you see we have another line of code to write on here. Now to put a sprite on a specific object, we have to tell the computer which object we want to put it on first. So it's going to be hero, and then dot sprite. Now that I'm accessing the sprite of the hero, I'm going to set it equal to a new sprite. And it's going to be sprite with these round brackets and an apostrophe inside. And inside those apostrophes, notice it added a second one automatically. We're going to write player.png. This is the name of the sprite I want to use in my asset list. So now, when I click stop and play, there he is. Let's go ahead and add another class and sprite. I'm going to create a gem class. Just like that. And I'm going to find a sprite for it in the asset store. The one I'm looking for is named gem yellow. There it is. And I'm going to call it yellow gem. Notice I'm using a capital G there. I just like to use what we call camel case to make things easier to read. Every time you start a new word, you use a capital letter. So you notice it shows up in our assets over here now. Let's go ahead and add the gem to the game. We'll go to the next line, and I'm actually going to skip a line. Just to make it easier to read, if we jumble up all our code, it looks a bit messy. So once again, we have to start by giving our new gem object a name. I'm going to name it Jemmy, and it's going to equal a gem class. And next, I'll add that sprite to it, the same way we did before. Jemmy dot sprite equals sprite with these round brackets and an apostrophe. And this time, I'm going to use the yellow gem sprite. Make sure you spell it exactly the way you have it in your assets. This function is looking specifically for this sprite in the asset list. And if I hit stop and play, look at that, it shows up right on top of the player. Now you might be wondering how to move the gem off the top of the player. Well for that, I'm going to bring you over to Sketchpad and I'll explain how objects are placed in the game. So here I've got my screen, and imagine there are two lines going across it like this. Now this may look familiar to some of you who have experience with graphs. If we have an x-axis and a y-axis, then the point where they meet is right in the middle at 0 and 0. So what this means is that the y equals 0 and the x equals 0. And if you look at our game, that's exactly where our objects are showing up. Because objects also have an x component and a y component. 
and we can change those to be whatever we want. Let's go ahead and move Jemmy on the x-axis. If I say Jemmy dot x equals 200. Let's see what happens. And there it is. It's moved over to the right. So if x equals 200 is here, that means whenever we use a positive number, we're going to be moving to the right. Likewise, if we go below zero using a negative number, we should move to the left. Let's try it out. And look at that. It moved to the left of the player. You can do the same thing by modifying the y. If I say jemmy.y equals 150, it moves up. And if I want to move down, I need to go below zero by using a negative number. There we are. Using this code, we can already set up the basics of our game, positioning everything around at the beginning. In the next lesson, we'll set up our game properly and then get stuff moving during the game. I'll see you there.